Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I, I got the feeling from what you were saying that you're very upbeat about the economy in the coming year. You, you don't see too many storm clouds on the horizon, I gather. Well, the, the pace of economic growth is, is slowing, um, and that's under the weight of these, the increase in interest rates we've had from the Reserve Bank you know, starting from May last year all the way to November. So you know, there's definitely uh, you know, the impact of those rate hikes is going to continue into next year and growth's going to slow. But compared to most other major economies around the world, Australia remains in pretty good shape. So you know, I think that's a, a positive point towards the end of this year. Yeah, indeed. But we, we are blessed in, in many ways, uh, natural resources. You did make a fairly big thing of the, uh, the mining industry. Uh, just how important? I mean, the coal is important. I guess the iron ore is important. I guess the gas is important. We better not forget how important the mining sector is. Well, yeah, that's right. I mean, particularly for our export markets, um, you know, iron ore and, and other resources, as you mentioned, like coal and gas are really critical. But uh, as I talked about last night, you know, that the world is going through a big change with the target of net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, that's going to change the nature of um, many economies, and including our resource sector. But uh, as you mentioned, we're, we're blessed with uh, significant reserves of lots of resources, uh, including many of those metals and minerals that will be critical to helping the world net, move to net zero by 2050. So the transition uh, to a lower carbon world, Australia has great opportunity uh, in the mining sector and other sectors to really benefit from that as well. This pursuit of renewables and this uh, goal, what we've got to achieve by 2030 and uh, net zero by 2050, uh, can we do that without doing irreparable harm to the economy? Oh, well, I think the simple answer to that question is yes, uh, but it's going to take a fair bit of time and money uh, the International Energy Agency has uh, estimated that global capital expenditure to get us to net zero is going to need to be about five trillion US dollars per year. Five we're trillion. Spending, is, yeah, is, we're is, currently is, spending about two and a half. Is that so worth it? Yeah. Is it? Is it worth it? Five trillion to, to get to net zero, and after all, they tell me that uh, swamplands and wetlands and deltas and believe it or not, termites produce more greenhouse gas than the human beings on the face of the planet? Uh, well, I haven't heard that one before, but I think, um, you know, we can see around the world, you know, a, a real need and a real desire to, to, to produce, the way I think about it, produce every unit of GDP with less carbon. And so that transition uh, is underway. It's going to have to accelerate. And uh, the message I wanted to give it is that there's, you know, there's, actually pretty significant opportunities for Australia yeah. in that change. Well, if we fix our 1% contribution to greenhouse gas and emissions generally, and China does absolutely nothing, and India does absolutely nothing, uh, surely our, our attempts are, are, are silly and wasted, well, along with our $5 to... trillion. Dollars. Well, the $5 trillion is is global, and oh, our, I see. Our, our spending will be a lot smaller than that. How much would it be um, for us? Um, it, it's it's more in the you know into the billions of dollars, so it's still significant, but it's not um, you know as you said, we're a, we're a small part of the global economy. Yeah. But um, so we, we've got to do our bit. But the the real issue is there is what we're exporting to the rest of the world, and so uh, there's opportunities for us to increase our exports of the critical metals and minerals needed to build the infrastructure to get us to net zero, to get the world to net zero by do, 2050. Do you see any storm clouds, anything on the horizon, anything we should be watching out for? Well, yes, uh, unfortunately. So internationally, there's uh, clearly some geopolitical risk with you know, two hot wars um, at the moment, Russia and Ukraine, and of course Israel and, the, and Hamas, uh, unfortunately. Um, It'd be, it would be, it would not be a good thing if those wars were to spread further. And uh, next year is a U.S. presidential election, so mm. you know it looks like it's going to be Biden versus Trump again. So that could be really, um, a, you know, a, a big event, a big risk for the world. But domestically, I think the, the major risk is is in the housing market, 
and we've got a big increase in demand for housing, mm -hmm. uh, both from you know natural population growth, but also a big increase in migration this year and, and likely next year. Uh, and the, the the property sector, the construction sector, is finding it very very difficult to deliver enough new supply of housing. Uh, so we've got a big increase in demand, uh, not enough supply. Yep. And when that happens, there's only one thing that can result, which is higher prices. So we're seeing house uh, dwelling prices increase quite significantly this year. Uh, they're going to increase more next year. We're back to all time record high mm. dwelling prices in Australia. Um, and it's going to take quite a number of years to, to solve that, you know, that supply uh, supply problem. So I think that's a that's a big issue for the local economy. When did it start to become? When did houses start to become unaffordable? I, I remember, uh, and I suspect that when I was buying my house, uh, would have been a bit like when my parents and grandparents were buying their house. That it was be it would probably be say three times one's annual income to buy a house. Yeah. Uh, now I think it's something like seven seven or eight times a person's much larger income to buy yeah. a house? When, when did that start? When, why, why did that happen? Well, it's, it's been happening for the last 20 years or more. Um, interest rates you know, progressively declined for more than a decade. Yeah. But really it's the and, – and, you know, it kind of sounds odd. You know, we're an incredibly large country with a relatively small population – but we all tend to, well, not all, most of us tend to like to live in the, you know, in the, a few big cities. And um, so we've had a you know, significant increase in demand, uh, not enough supply coming on. Yeah. Uh, lower interest rates mean people can borrow more money. That helps push us up the prices as well. I think we focus too much on the demand side of the housing uh, equation, not enough on the supply side. So housing in Australia is expensive. You know, we've got one of the highest household debt to income ratios in the world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, right now the, the problems are being exacerbated by, if you like, the, the leftover from the, the COVID restrictions with, you know, global supply chain of materials and people, but um, a big increase in population growth this year and next year. And we want... And we, so, um, yeah. We all want to own a house. We all, yep. uh, preferably with a quarter-acre block and a house on it, uh, uh, people in other parts of the world seem to be quite happy to rent all their entire lives. Yes, and, and one of the issues there is, uh, you know, in Australia, you can really only get rents for six or maybe 12-month contract at a time. Yeah. Whereas in other countries, particularly in Europe, you can have uh, rental agreements that, goes for, that go for years and years. So... Um, you know, the, the certainty, there's much more certainty in, in other countries about how long you'll be able to stay in the place you're renting. Yeah. Uh, in Australia, it's basically a year-by-year -year prospect. Inflation is on the way down by the look of it. What was it, 4.9% down from 5.6? Uh, yeah, so the, the, yeah, the October reading was 4.9. That's yeah. the, the monthly, what they call the CPI indicator. Um for the September quarter, which is the last quarterly number, it was 5.2%. And we peaked at 7.8% in the December quarter last year. So it's clearly decelerating, as is inflation around the, most of the rest of the world. So we're, we're well off the highs, but we've still got a way to go before we get back into the, the target range, which for us here in Australia is 2 to 3%. Yep. But would, you, would you say we're in for a soft landing? You can't, I don't think you mentioned last night anything about a recession. Yeah, that's right. So, so our forecast is a soft landing, no, no recession here in Australia. Um, so economic growth is going to be modest yes, next year. We, we're forecasting 1.6% economic growth in Australia next year. The, you know, the long run average is about 2.7% per year. So it's going to feel pretty slow and, and pretty difficult for many people next year. Uh, but we're not forecasting a recession. So that's good news. Are you forecasting any more interest rate rises? Uh, no, we're not. We, we think our base case is no more rate hikes um, and the deceleration in inflation that we saw in the October numbers supports that view. There's another Reserve Bank board meeting next week on Tuesday. We, we, we think there's very little chance of a rate hike next week. Uh, February next year would probably be the, the danger point. We do get uh, the December quarter inflation numbers at the end of January and by February next year we'll know how spending has gone over the holiday period. November is likely to be pretty solid for spending. December week, as people are going to bring forward their Christmas shopping to the 
Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Uh, but overall, we think the signs of the economy slowing, uh, inflation decelerating means the Reserve Bank will be able to keep interest rates on hold now for an extended period. Stephen, I've always wanted to ask an economist uh, this question. Why don't we, why can't we claim uh, inflation as a tax deduction? Well, 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 that's a good question. I don't know the answer to the question. But um, you see what I mean? Well, if, I if, guess, you know, the yeah. money that I've got either in my pocket or in the bank uh, is worth uh, 5% uh, or 4.9, say 4.9% less at the end of the year. Mm. I, I, uh, that's, the, the government should take responsibility for that. I should be able to claim what inflation has done to my wealth against my income. Well, I guess there, as you mentioned, it's 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 the government, right? So that would reduce revenue oh, to the yes. government. Yeah, you know, this indexation and that jump and on inflation is, immediately. Yeah. yeah. So then the then the question is, okay, that reduced revenue flow. Does that mean we have budget deficits, or you know, what do they do with spending? So it would be, um, you know, it would have a big impact on the flow of money, as you said, between you know the private sector and the, and the government sector, hmm. um, which is probably why the government's not so keen to do that. No, I don't know that they've even thought about it, but it just strikes me that if if uh, if uh, something is eating away at the value of every dollar, uh, it would be reasonable to sort of be able to claim it from someone, and the government just seems to me to be a, a likely candidate. Um, uh, in America, uh, I think I saw that inflation there had come down to something like 2%. Uh no, no, not that far yet, but it's definitely coming down. It's it's three point two percent, the most recent reading. Right. Two uh, percent is the the target of the U.S. Fed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the inflation is decelerating in the U.S. quite quickly, which is good news. So again, we think the no more interest rate increases from the U.S. Federal Reserve, and markets have been responding positively to that in recent weeks. Oh, well, that's fine. I hope you enjoy your stay in Adelaide, Stephen. Thank you very much for giving us your valuable time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's great to meet you and um, chat again soon. Thank you. Stephen Helmerick, Chief Economist with the Commonwealth Bank. 